Hi, can you hear me? Yes? Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you very much for coming today. Out of interest, how many of you are already uh, sort of tech leads or lead developers? Maybe engineering managers or some sort of people? Excellent. Who would like to be one of those sorts of roles? Excellent. You're in the right place. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about talking with tech leads. Uh, my background is sort of working and developing technical leadership. Um, I work for a bank called N26. We're a German bank based in Berlin. And we have a mission to be the first bank you'll love. And it's often one of those things you don't really hear in the same sentence, bank and love. Um, we really try to invest in our user experience. And my role there is chief scientist and former CTO there. So we've really scaled up our tech team over the last couple of years, grown from 50 to 350 people in, in uh, two years' time. And part of my focus was really helping us scale. And part of this is really understanding how do we scale technical leadership, which is the topic I'll be talking about today. Um, I've written a number of books, but the sort of book that we'll be focusing on is one called Talking with Tech Leads, so the title of this talk. Um, and I actually also run a course of helping people step into this role for existing people or not. Uh, as an existing leader in tech, you may also be interested in a curated newsletter that I run called Level Up. It's kind of a weekly newsletter that talks about everything about leadership topics, trends in technology, uh, and then also things that I read about in processes and organizations. But today's journey, we'll be talking about the atypical journey of what do people go on when they step into a leadership role like a tech lead. So we'll be looking at where do people come from, how do they fall into this role. We'll also look at what do I mean by a tech lead. So all of you who've played this role will probably start to realize we don't really have a common industry term. It's a little bit different in every sort of organization, and that's why it's important to understand what I mean by a tech lead. And then we'll look at perhaps some of the surprises and struggles that people have when they step into this role. So you've probably experienced some of these if you've already played this role. But if you're not, you may find that these things are very surprising for the first time as you experience them. And then we'll close off with a number of tools and tips that will help make you an even better tech lead from this perspective. So the first question is, how do people start off? Uh, and we'll have a look at some lessons learned along the way. So the first question is, how do people start off in terms of being this tech lead? Now, we're all developers by background, and this is really where our story starts. Most of us start off as an engineer writing code, be it JavaScript, HTML, backend, whatever sort of code that we have. And over time, we want more impact. We want to have a, a bigger challenge. right? And most of us think a leading role is that bigger challenge and sort of step. Now, in other sort of perspectives, other people see people having already a lot of impact and maybe want to be sort of pushed into an even greater challenge. And this is kind of the common path. So these two paths that we kind of talk about are the personal person saying, I would like to be promoted. Give me a bigger challenge. I want more responsibility. And the other side is when you have other people in the organization looking at who is already having a lot of impact and say, hey, I think you're ready for a promotion. And this is often what happens when uh, organizations are going through sort of review processes of then people saying, OK, you're now a tech lead or a lead developer. But it's interesting um, when you think about this, because most people think of it as a step up in a career ladder, right? So I'm changing roles. I now have greater responsibility. But one big takeaway I want you to already have is don't think of it as a step up in this ladder. And we'll come back to a little bit why. Now, let's say that you've gone through this process, you've either got the promotion that you wanted, or you've been sort of given this title. Now, most people, when they step into this role for the first time, they go back to their sort of computer, and they're sort of programming. But you know, they have this title, this badge, or something that says you now have different responsibility. What do you do differently? And in a lot of organizations, people don't really walk people through what does this role mean and help people prepare. And so most lead devs, tech leads, find themselves in a position where they're really thinking, oh, well, I'm just going back to writing my code, right? So I'm going to write even more code because that's what is expected of me. And this is one of the biggest challenges of this role is that it's actually really different. So lesson number one is really recognizing that this isn't a promotion but a role change. And that's really interesting because a role is a collection of different responsibilities. But what we're actually saying is, you know, not being a developer or an engineer, you're now being a tech lead that requires different skills and different responsibilities. And that may not be exactly what you were doing as a developer beforehand. So let's go back to this idea of a career ladder and our mental model of what this means to sort of climb this career ladder. 
And um, one of the things about scaling up an organization is often establishing what is a good sort of growth framework for a lot of people. Um, so a career ladder typically looks like this, where you have different types of responsibilities and roles. And a higher level often has more impact or broader responsibility. Right? So you often describe the behavior expected at this role and also the broader impact that you have. Now, if you think about using a, a career ladder, um, you know, we've been sort of developing our own. There's a couple of things that we've learned. So don't see it as a complete checklist. So a lot of people often say, well, I'm doing all of these things, therefore I'm ready for this promotion or I'm already playing this role. The issue is that people aren't exactly the same, right? So everyone's slightly different. So it's a guide for a conversation around what people have in terms of impact in their roles. Um, and one of the great benefits of it, it helps reduce systematic bias, right? So when you have a manager who says, oh, I have a gut feel that you're ready for this or not ready for this, this gives you a bit more of an objective criteria to say, okay, what are expectations and where are they written down so you can start to steer that conversation. So what does a, a career ladder look like for a lot of engineers? Well, you know, you start off going to the industry, maybe as an intern, maybe as a junior software engineer, and you need a lot of help building uh, sort of software, right? Somebody is walking through all the steps, writing tests, refactoring, uh, designing clean code. As you gain experience, you become more independent, and you sort of maybe get a promotion to a software engineer. You want more responsibility. You can tackle maybe bigger problems without too much assistance. And then maybe you get promoted to a senior software engineer where maybe you're starting to mentor one or two other engineers, where you're maybe responsible for a set of maybe small microservices. Uh, and this is where people think, OK, well, now you're ready for that sort of tech lead role. And most people think this is the sort of step up in that same career ladder. Now, in the US, it's very interesting because they often talk about a two-track career path. So you'll often hear being an IC or an individual contributor uh, or moving into management. I would actually argue, and I talk a lot about this, I've written an article where I argue that there's a three-track process. So one which is really about technical leadership. And we'll talk about each of these different tracks and how I differentiate between these things. So when you think about these roles, most people think, well, it's the same track. It's majority of what I was doing before. But with this model of understanding where do your focuses of responsibilities and skill lie, they're actually quite different in terms of its role and scope. So this tech lead role is clearly sitting within this technical leadership uh, sort of track. And then maybe you have people like engineering managers or development managers sitting more on the management track. So what does this actually mean? What do you do in each of these different tracks? Well, if you look at your sort of schedule, let's have a look at what, where you spend most of your time on a sort of weekly basis. So as an individual contributor, most of you will know this, you spend 70 to 80% of your time executing or doing. Now, all engineers don't write code 100% of the time. Good engineers will hopefully be showing their work to users, talking to other sort of engineers about designs, getting code reviews, right? So it's not 100% of the time, but a lot of the time is at your computer doing and executing. So some of the tasks are maybe designing software at a whiteboard, right? Uh, it's often about sort of testing your software to make sure it's actually uh, working well, and also, of course, then writing that software. And this is what a lot of individual contributors will actually be doing. Now, if we look at a different track, let's talk about the management track. I often talk about managing the system. So good engineering managers won't manage people. They'll lead people. But they'll manage the system to allow engineers to be a lot more effective. What does this look like? Well, it's often about supporting, right? So helping people connect with other people in the organization. Uh, it's often about sort of planning, right? Trying to make sure that work is connected into the greater set of organizational goals. Uh, it's often about budgeting, right? So it's either headcount or uh, financial budgeting. Uh, and it's also often about organizing. So team structures, processes to help optimize smooth delivery. And this is very much management skills. Uh, which, if you're an engineering manager, you'll spend a lot of your time doing. Now, what does this mean for the technical leadership track? Well, this is leading technical topics and teams, right? So this is really thinking about things like aligning the team. Do we have 15 different coding styles on a sort of coding base? Or do we have a consistent way of approaching things as a team? Uh, it's often about technical risk management. So are we sort of thinking about what could possibly go wrong and thinking about designs and safety to make sure that we build reliable systems? It's often about building a technical vision. Are we moving, say, from a monolith to microservices? 
or are we just trying to sort of create more modularity within the system that we have? Uh, this is really about that technical vision. Um, it's often about tech debt management, convincing product people that now is the right time to get rid of that legacy system that's uh, breaking performance or will slow uh, productivity down. And it's often about growing technical knowledge, right? So this is about making sure that you don't have single points of failure in your team and that everyone in their sort of engineering paths are actually growing and having more impact along their own journey. And so these sorts of skills are actually very different from management skills. And these skills are also very different from what you were doing as an engineer before. So a top tip when you're sort of going on this journey is to recognize that what got you here won't get you there. It's often said that the best engineers will make the worst tech leaders because they'll just keep being the best engineer. But as we've seen, what you're expected to do is actually quite different from what you were doing as an engineer. And so you have to actually take this mental model shift from what you're doing and think about how do you become more effective at creating that environment for other engineers to be more effective. So this is your archetypical story. Let's talk a little bit more about this definition about what do I mean by a tech lead. Let's be a little bit more precise. So what I describe as a tech lead is a software engineer, so somebody who has written code, uh, responsible for leading a development team, but also responsible for the internal quality. Now, this is very interesting because I've seen really effective engineering managers come from other disciplines, right? So quality engineering, project management, or product. But it's very difficult to lead technical topics unless you understand how things are built, right? You need to give people advice and understand the technical trade-offs when people are making decisions, which is why it has to be a software engineer by background. Um, it also, you need a good way of being able to evaluate the internal quality of software. And that's really hard if you're not an engineer yourself. So this is uh, sort of the definition I like to use. Um, you know, there are three sort of areas of code that you should sort of focus on. Sorry, that didn't really turn out too well. But it's around leadership skills, developer skills, and architecture skills. Uh, and you know, this is a, a sort of tip here, which is the this role really requires leadership skills. Now, if you think about your own sort of personal training, a lot of the time as a developer, you're probably investing in learning new tools and frameworks, new architectural patterns, but it's very rare that you're being nudged to learn about leadership skills, right? So when you're actually in this role for the first time, you rely on these skills, but you may not have developed the practice and finesse for understanding what this means. And so this is a really key tip to understand to be more effective, you need to focus on this area. So another analogy is if you've played games like role-playing games, right? What often happens is you're building up experience and you're allocating these experience points to different traits. And so as a developer, what you've probably been doing is allocating all of these to developing better. Better code, refactoring, architectural patterns. Maybe some of you have actually got some experience building some systems. So you might have built up some architecture systems, understood a little bit more about different types of complex systems. Um, and maybe you've had some leadership experience, maybe ad hoc through personal engagements with community groups or sports groups. But what's interesting is that there's often a big gap in imbalance. And this is what the key lesson is, is you need to find a way of readdressing this imbalance. Because you as a tech lead, you're not going to be measured by personally how much code you write. It's really about the output of the entire team, not, not, not necessarily what you will be doing individually. So you need to readdress this balance. So good thing is, there's a simple way to shift this. First thing is, you're all here. So it's awareness that you need to be uh, readdressing this balance. The second part is then trying to find training around what does it mean around architecture and leadership skills, depending on what you've done in the past. Um, but training isn't the only thing. You really need to also get feedback. So finding a mentor, getting a coach to give you input about what you're doing to find alternative ways will help you be a lot more effective. And the key, key thing here is really about practice, right? So as an engineer, you rely on things like maybe code cutters and sort of doing sort of scrap uh, prototype projects to develop that skill. And that's the sort of practice that you get about applying this. And this is the same thing with any leadership or architecture sort of skills. You have to find ways of actually practicing this to turn sort of that theory into the sort of innate knowledge and habits of what you do. So key takeaway is really understanding that you will have focused on the circle of developer skills, and you really need to start focusing on developing your leadership and architecture skills if you want to be a lot more well-balanced as a tech lead. 
So uh, co a common question I often get is, how much should a tech lead code? So you're not going to be measured by exactly all the code you produce. But at the same time, you need to understand what's changing in the sort of code base. So what's a good amount? My rule of thumb here is approximately 30% of time of code with the team. Now, this is interesting because it's often about reading code more than maybe writing code. And um, it's never consistent week to week, right? So there will be some times in a project where you'll be maybe pulled away for more forward planning, right? Where you have to agree with other teams about perhaps the interface to your system. But your team is writing a lot more code at the same time. And as we've all learned, software systems don't really stand still. They're constantly changing and evolving. And so, you know, as teams might be starting to diverge, you as a leader need to go back to understand how they're diverging or if they're diverging so you can actually um, readdress this. So if you've spent a lot of time away from the code base recently, what this is telling you is that, you know, after maybe two weeks of planning or time away from the team, you probably need to catch up and understand what has changed in that code base to understand what are the risks that are actually emerging as a result. Um, this is a really simple test to see if you're effective as a tech lead. So does the code base look like it was written by a single person? Now, it never will, but the point here is if you sort of squint and you look at the shapes of code, what you're looking for are patterns of consistency, right? So can you open up a code base and you say, okay, this person has written a lot of code with functional programming. They've loved all of these uh, functional lambdas all of a sudden. And then you go to this part of the code base and you see lots of OO inheritance, right? That's telling you something about the team, about different diverging styles and a lack of a consistent approach. And so you as a tech lead are constantly looking for where there is divergence and then trying to find a way of sort of reconverging as a team. So um, one of the really greatest books that I learned a lot very early on when leading teams was a book called Refactoring to Patterns. And this is really about how you as a team are agreeing on which patterns you use for the problems that you commonly in, uh, have, right? So if you have agreed for a persistence layer of having some sort of repository pattern, um, you know, this is kind of the direction that you have uh, with your team, rather than having different types of uh, persistence uh, styles across your code base. So you need to lead these technical topics. Now, the good thing is, leadership has been studied and continues to be studied because it's so relevant in every organization and every role. And there are lots of different skills that you can invest in. Um, and as a result, there's actually a lot of different training that you can find out there. You just need to understand where you would you like to focus on. Now, one interesting thing I've learned is that every leader has their own style and every strength and weakness. And so you need to work out where your gaps are to work out which things are the best things for you to invest in. Now, as I said, there's a lot of resources out there, and these are some of the books that I often recommend for different types of traits, right? So uh, let's say that you're trying to convince product people to invest in tech debt. You know, there's a book about influence here, which is really about trying to get people who are outside of your scope of authority to help you with your goals of what you're trying to have, right? Uh, if you're trying to influence a different team with a technical direction that you don't have say over, these books can be really powerful as well. Uh, Getting to Yes is also a really great book, which is, you know, trying to navigate conflict within your own team. What happens if your team disagrees about which library to use for a particular function? You're going to have to navigate these conversations, and these are wonderful resources to help you get better at doing these. So a key uh, uh, quote here, uh, reading is still the main way that I both learn new things and test my understanding. And this is really fascinating because this comes from a person who's been in technology for way longer than I have. Uh, this is actually Bill Gates in 2016, right? And it's very interesting because this is so accessible to all of you in these roles around architecture or leadership skills. You just have to know what you need to find and actually read it, uh, but make sure that you actually put it into action. So lesson three is really benefiting from these many resources on leadership, uh, but be sure to practice. Now, one of the hardest things about practicing is you're always dealing with people. And this is one of the hard things is that, you know, when you're dealing with a computer and something fails, you're in a safer environment. But one of the tricks that you have to find as a leader is trying to test out new things in a way that doesn't have a big impact to your team as well. And it's one of those struggles that every leader sort of faces when, when learning and self-developing as well. So we've looked at the story. We've looked at what I mean by a tech lead. Let's look at some of the common surprises and struggles. And some of you who've played these roles will recognize these. 
For you, those of you who, aren't, who haven't yet, uh, prepare for them. But these are all sort of common things that everyone goes through. And we'll look at three surprises and struggles in particular. So the first one is depicted by this set of people and sort of one person in the corner. And perhaps you start to recognize this if you've played this role. And this is called the feeling of being alone, right? As an engineer, you turn around and you're surrounded by other engineers. You can complain, you can you know, uh, brainstorm approaches because everyone shares the same context. But suddenly, you've kind of got two feet in sort of the code, but then a little bit away because you have responsibility for all the engineers as well. And so this is actually really hard because you can often feel like you can't share information. You have to deal with these problems by yourself. You have this feeling of being an outsider, right? So you have to feel like you have to take the burden of decisions by yourself. Um, and it's sort of caused by this different role. Other roles on your team, so product people often have this as well, or user experience people. Um, and you can actually use them to also brainstorm different topics depending on the type of thing to build your own sort of support structure. It's also a consequence of trying to shield and filter uh, information, right? So there's a trade-off that you'll never ever get right of everyone uh, or of some people on the team will want all the information possible, but at the same time, some people on the team won't want all the information because it's a distraction. And so you're often playing this game of trying to balance the right level of information that gives people the best context, which contributes to this feeling of being alone. Very natural, uh, very common. The second one is depicted by these sorts of arrows going in different directions. And uh, I still struggle with this one, and this is really about uncertainty, right? Uh, it's really interesting when you work with computers and when you're working with organizations and people, because they're very different, right? So as an engineer, you're often trained to think that there is this right answer. But when you're actually dealing with people or teams, you never have a perfect answer. You might have a good enough answer for now, and as you gather more information, that solution may actually evolve and change as well. But if you ever wait to get the right answer, you're going to be waiting too long, right? So this is very common. It's also trained in us as engineers. We have this binary habit. So if you're doing test-driven development, right? I write my test, it goes red. I know it's wrong. I write the right code, it goes green. This is the right solution, right? We don't get this feedback when we're dealing with people or teams all the time. It might be right for one person, but then you might be hearing from another person about a particular decision of saying, oh, I didn't really agree with that decision. And so this is some of the struggles that you'll have of not knowing if you made the right decision. Um, and as I said before, we're always dealing with imperfect information is that we'll learn something later that may change our solution. And so we always have to sort of pitch ourselves at understanding we're trying to do the best thing that we can, given the information we have right now, but understanding that we'll collect more information over time. So feeling alone, being uncertain, these are kind of scary things. Uh, the last one is this uh, sort of picture of a snowflake, and maybe you start to understand what this is. This is really that people are puzzling, right? So every person is a snowflake. Everyone is unique and different. Uh, and this means that we have to accustomize ourselves to dealing with people's differences and understanding that uh, everyone has a different style and preference. What can be really powerful is appreciating people for their different strengths. And I'll talk about strengths a little bit later. Um, but one of the things to be careful of is not stereotyping. So over time, you'll get to learn patterns. But patterns are really useful because they might help you understand how people might react. The difference between archetypes and stereotypes is archetypes help you prepare, but stereotypes, you pretend you know exactly how somebody's going to react. And when you do that, you're going to be really disappointed or surprised because that person will often react very differently from what you expected because they're that unique snowflake. So I'm still amazed by the difference and the breadth of how different everyone is. And you also have to appreciate that and understand where people can actually use their sort of strengths. So these struggles and surprises are very common for anyone in any leadership role. Uh, and if you're sort of not playing this role yet, be prepared. Uh, it'll come as a shock to you as an engineer when you have to deal with each of these elements. So lesson number four is taking comfort that others have been on the same tech lead journey. So this means that you know if you are feeling alone, don't feel alone because there are other people that have been part of this. Reach out maybe not to people on your team, but maybe people in the same organization playing that same role. Or reach out to people playing that role in a different organization and find a way to connect with people that can talk about the problems that you might feel you're alone for. You know, in dealing with uncertainty, you'll never have the right answer, but if you talk to other people, you'll build up a toolkit of different approaches. 
Now, that won't mean that each of those approaches will ever work perfectly, but at least it'll help you deal with a lot of this uncertainty. So a top tip uh, in this is really making sure that you build your support structure, right? So find your way to uh, vent without venting at your team. Find a way to bounce ideas off with other people. But it's really essential if you're going to be successful in this role to do this uh, in a sort of uh, supporting way. So we looked at surprises and struggles. Let's have a quick look at some tools and uh, um, things that can make you a lot more effective as a great tech lead. So the first thing is really a focus on developing others. Your role as a tech lead is not developing code anymore. It's really developing others to develop better code. right? So you're a multiplier and amplifier now. Um, and what this means is you often have this kind of binary habit again of either telling people what to do, right? So here is how you should write the code, here's how you should structure the code. Or you might get into this habit of saying, okay, can you take care of this task? And over time, you'll develop actually a much more uh, complex framework of understanding how to interact with people. And there is this uh, leadership framework called Situation Leadership Model that helps you understand there are more approaches than just telling or delegating, right? So for some people, particularly more experienced people, you don't really want to tell them what to do because they're all very smart and experienced uh, and they'll rebel. What you might want to do is help coach them, right? So this might be about selling them the opportunity, why this problem is really important to the business or why they themselves should actually take part because it's a growth opportunity for them. So that's a, a leadership model that can be quite useful for some types of topics. There are other topics that are actually really complex that you don't know how to break it up yourself because you've never done it before. And experienced people probably have never done it before as well. And so this is often a mode where you're actually working with them to develop a, a solution together. So this is participatory leadership. And so over time, what you'll try to look, look at is understanding when you should uh, use each style in the context that you have. So where do you use these styles and when? There's a few different uh, situations you might want to consider. So one is skill, right? Uh, a really good example is when you have people fresh into the industry from perhaps university. They're really eager, really motivated, but then they don't really have a lot of experience. So this is where being more directive or breaking things down of, OK, you need to structure code here. You need to write tests. You need to make sure that there's good deployment scripts. Uh, these are things that will determine more directive style leadership. But over time, that person will learn, right? So that person doesn't need to be told anymore. And so this is where you might need to participate with them to help them solve, understand what gaps there might be, to the point where you can actually delegate as well. Now, motivation is a really interesting one as well. So you know, if somebody is bored, right, this is where you might need to move into a selling mode to help them understand how their work is having an impact. So even though you know, you know that they're capable of completing something, you might need to take a bit more of a selling mode to help them understand how their work is having an impact on the business or uh, uh, um, on the team. The third trait that you might want to consider is really about urgency. Right? So let's say that you have a production outage of whatever product you have. That's not really the time to sort of say, hey, what do you think we should be doing, right? Like, that's not really about the delegating. This is really where you want to take action. But you shouldn't be directive all the time because that will sort of take out empowerment from the team that you have. So the, the urgency of a decision might also influence what style of leadership uh, that you take. So another sort of good tip is to really to tap into diverse approaches, right? So. Um, one of the best books that I really enjoyed is called this book called Strengths Finder. It catalogs about 34 different types of strengths. And when you read the book, you do an online survey, and it says what your top five strengths are. Now, what's interesting is you'll have your top five, but that means that you have 29 strengths that aren't your strengths, right? But this is one of the great things about why we work in teams, is that we can actually work with other people who have different strengths. So stronger as a team because you have all the strengths covered, but you yourself don't need to have those strengths. And over time as a leader, you'll start to recognize what strengths people have in your team. So some examples are achievers. You get a lot of achievers in startup land. I actually have this strength, and I notice this because I like to write uh, lists, and I like to cross things off of that list. Right? I need a sense of progress, sense of achievement. Um, you have some people who have the strength of woo. So woo stands for winning others over, right? You may know people like this. They walk into a room and they walk out with best friends with everyone. Or they walk into a room and they can convince everyone this is the right idea. Small percentage of people have them, 
But if you're trying to influence people in your organization, knowing who has this strength is really uh, key and important. You also have people who have analytical strength, right? So these are actually really great people if you have complex problems or things that are life critical or safety critical, because you'll have these people that want to think about this problem from many different perspectives, try to work out where things will break, how to make things more robust. Um, but you can see some tensions between perhaps an achiever who wants to get something done quickly and an analytical person who'll want more time to actually understand a problem and maybe do a bit more research. Um, and this is where somebody with the strength of harmony really comes in. And if you have this as a leader, this is really great, because what you're trying to do is really create harmony within imbalances in your team. And uh, they're really important people to have. So a key lesson with the strengths finder is really recognizing that people have these different sets of strengths. Recognize where your team has different strengths may involve conflicts, and so you might need to find a way to harmonize that. Um, but it also might mean, as a team, you lack strengths as well still. So understand where your blind spots are as a team to understand if you're maybe too achieving and getting the wrong things done, uh, or maybe too analytical and maybe not getting enough things done as well. So there's a balance there to be had. Now, it's really interesting because there's a lot of research around diversity today. And one of the latest reports I could find was from BCG that was talking about how does diversity actually affect commercial revenue? Um, and so this is actually innovation uh, revenue. So this is about new projects that actually result in better um, uh, sort of business outcomes. And they looked at six different sort of uh, elements and they actually found only four of them actually had a significant impact. So gender, country of origin, industry, and uh, career path. So it's really fascinating because one of the ones that disappeared is academic background. And I think that resonates personally with my own experiences that I've met engineers that have come from no academic background, studying physics, philosophy, comp sci, because everyone can add different ways of solving problems. And that's really fascinating to understand. So another tool is really understanding how do you invest your time in. One of the biggest challenges of any leader is working out where do you spend time and how to manage your time. Uh, one of the most important frameworks I've, I've used is understanding this thing called the Eisenhower matrix. So um, what you try to do is classify what are the things that you do and then try to understand where you're spending your time. So as an example, uh, there are things that you'll want to delete. These are the less urgent and less important. So if you think about every time that Slack pings you a message and you respond, right? Uh, that's an interrupt to your schedule and you might need to stop checking uh, your sort of Slack messages all the time. Uh, things like social media, um, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, these are things that you probably want to reduce that aren't actually important and valuable. Now the things that are urgent and important, these are the things that you do immediately, right? So crisis in production, all hands on deck, you need to actually take action. But the thing that is most important that is often forgotten about is this quadrant here. So this is the important and less urgent. What's interesting about this quadrant is that nobody will ever ask you to do those things. They expect you to do those things. But it means that nobody is ever going to put a meeting in your calendar that says, can you think about the important things? Because they expect you to do it. And this is where you need to work out what is important for your team and block out time to make sure that you decide to deal with those topics. So it may change. It may be about thinking about how do you break this big technical debt up into smaller chunks. It may be about how do you uh, get the right skill in. Maybe the team is missing a certain capability, and you have to grow that sort of skill in, and that's going to take some time as well. Perhaps it's about recruiting or retention, right? So these are topics that nobody will ever ask you for. They expect you to sort of take care of it. But it takes time to think about how you're going to approach this as a leader. So you really have to decide to make that time in your schedule to think about what is those uh, important elements. So that's the Eisenhower matrix. Uh, and lesson five is really making sure that you move from maker to multiplier mode. Right? So you are never going to be awarded for what you personally do. You're going to be rewarded for what your team accomplishes as a group working together. And that's where you really need to focus your, your sort of uh, efforts and your sort of training. So we looked at where people come from on this journey of being a tech lead. We've looked at what I mean by a tech lead, looked at some of the surprises and struggles of what this are, and hopefully given you some tips and tools that you can go away to be a lot more effective. So the path never stops on this journey of leadership. I'm still developing myself in all aspects, and you can as well. But to summarize, what are the keys to growth that you can take away? Well, the first one is really making sure that you understand that this is a role change, not a promotion. It requires different skills. 
It requires leadership skills in particular, which you may not have invested in that you need to invest in now. Take comfort that others have been on this journey, right? So you don't have to suffer this by yourself. You can get support with other people and find ways to uh, come up with new ideas. Um, and be sure to tap into the many resources available out there. Books, articles, topics, uh, experience reports. Uh, and take a shift from your mental model from being this maker, being rewarded for what you personally do, and take excitement from what you were able to create with the whole of your team through being a multiplier effect. So I'm Patrick Hua, and that's Talking With Tech Leads. Thank you. Uh -huh.